chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. How many of you have your Bibles? Okay, so it's very easy to find. The first chapter, the first verse of the Bible. <laughs> and the title of my message today is In the Beginning. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning. In the beginning. You know, when I want to learn something about the subject, you know where do I start? The beginning. I know that some people go to the bookstore and they, they get, grab a book and they go to the, to the last chapter to see how the book ends. I really don't like that. I like to, to have still the mystery of understanding what's in between the beginning and the end of the book. Uh, first time I grabbed the Bible, someone gave me a Bible that was so thick that I thought, how am I going to be able to read all this? I've never read a, a book this thick. And uh, so I read a little bit in the beginning, then I got bored, and then I read a little bit at the end, and I got excited because I really liked the book of Revelation. And this year we're going to, to mention a lot about the book of Revelation. But, uh, but because I couldn't understand the book of Revelation, I thought I'll better start from the beginning. So I went to the beginning. And the Bible is really easy to understand. But I'd like just to focus on, on this first sentence. Let me tell you, the Bible wasn't first written in English. I, I know that aliens and uh, you know those science fiction movies, all the aliens speak English. But uh, uh, God didn't wrote, didn't gave us the Bible in English. Uh, and the original Hebrew, guess what? Doesn't have commas, points, question marks. There's no punctuation. So it's a, quite a little bit different the way uh, it was written. Uh, but, but then when the Bible is translated, there's experts in language that try to give the right meaning to the sentence. But uh, I'd like just uh, for the sake of today's message, without changing the Bible, I would like to remove the comma, the first comma of the Bible. And I'm going to read again the beginning of this verse. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. What's in the beginning? God. God. So, when we start reading this awesome book, Scripture, we need to understand that this is a book about God and about mankind. Now I'm going to read the verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And there was evening. And there was morning. The first thing. So here's the, here's the beginning. In the beginning, God. So God comes first in the Bible. I know the Bible talks about Lots of men and women, people of faith, the, the people of Israel, uh, the Egyptians, the Lebanese. The, it talks about numerous things. However, the, the, the heart of the Bible is to give us a, a message that comes right from heaven, from, from, from God. So if we want to understand God and our relationship with God, and we came to church, I guess because we want to have more fellowship with God, we want to have more of God in our lives, we want to ask God to do something for us, there's different reasons why we come to church. But let me tell you, if you came here, the message today is very simple. Put God first. We need to learn how to put God first. So uh, as we start reading the Bible, we see that in the beginning, we have God. So what comes first? Really simple. God. And if I want to have success in my life, I need to put God also first in everything that I do. And many Christians, I know they give their hearts to the Lord, they're called Christians, but they start even their days by waking up, and when they wake up, the first thing they say is, Oh no, <laughs> not again. Stupid alarm clock. I have to go to that job that I hate. And they start the day by cursing their baby. However, 
What about if we start our day, however, we can do the, the, the opposite and start the day by praising God? Amen. It's the beginning of the day. You know, I, I discipline myself, even if I don't like the sound of my alarm clock, I discipline myself to confess the first thing I say in the morning. It is God, I thank you for this day. Another day of victory is with you. I thank you, Lord. You know, I know that some of you, when you jump out of bed, the first thing you say is, ah! <laughs> Ooh! And uh, especially those of you that are not getting uh, younger, <laughs> sometimes you can start the day with, ah! Let me say, ah, Lord! I love you so much! <laughs> and skip the complaining. Skip that sentence. Another day uh, 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 on my work, or I hate my job, all these things. So, if you start doing this, what comes first in your, in your day? God. What about spending some time with God in the morning? You know, five minutes with God. Everything that comes first in your life eventually becomes your God. And, and as Christians, we can put a lot of things first. We can put church first. It's not church that comes first. It's God. We can put our family first. Some people even put their jobs first because they, they will say things like, oh, I would like to learn more and come more often to the church, but my work, my work, my work, my work. Listen, your work happens, I guess, six days a week and then you have two. And even if you work every single day, you can have some time for God. You can separate some time for God. In fact, the first commandment in Exodus chapter 20 in verse 3, it says, You shall have no other gods before me. So this is a commandment. Why did God deliver this commandment to His people? Because He knew they were all their priorities messed up. They, they would say, Well, I need to take care of the fields. I need to bury my father. I need to do this. I need to do that. But you know what? God wants to have the first place in our lives. And when we do, when voluntarily we say, God, I want to put you first. You're ahead of everything. You're more important than my marriage. You're more important than my kids. You're more important than my job. When you confess these things and when you have it in your heart, guess what? God will come and He will bless you tremendously. He will bring you the things that you desire in your heart. Now, let's go back to the first, to this first verse. Uh, a, a scripture and it says in the beginning God and then there's another word create so in the beginning God create not only God is the beginning but he is the creator without him there's nothing everything that exists exists because God created it first and he's not only he was the creator he is the creator and some people think that he stopped his creative process they think, they, or they say, well, uh, God did miracles in the past, but He doesn't do miracles anymore. Because they fail to understand that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Amen. He wasn't the Creator. He is the Creator. Yes. And He continues to create things. And He will create new things. He creates new days. He creates plenty of new things. Some people put God in a museum, and they say, uh, those things of God and religion belong to the past. Now we have technology, we have all these things, we don't need God. That's, that's that wrong, you know. The reason why us, mankind, we create so many things, it's because we were created in the image of God. So we are also created. We create new things. There's an evolution of things. Some Christians, they say that if you're a Christian, you, you don't believe in evolution. If you don't believe in evolution, you're stupid. You're not Christian. And I'll say it again and again and again. Observe. Open your eyes. Christians are intelligent people. God is the creator. He didn't stop creating. He didn't create just the animals in Genesis. There's new species. There's new things that are happening all the time. There's evolution of things because God created things this way. Let us accept it. He is the Creator, and we worship Him. He's a fully supernatural God. God will always surprise us. He will, he will create ways where there are no ways. Gardens in the wilderness. 
He will create rivers in the desert. Things that we cannot understand or imagine. In fact, the Bible says He is able to do way above what we ask or think. Maybe you're asking too little. And God will say, I want to give you more than what you ask. A young man, Solomon, asked the Lord, Lord, give me wisdom. And God said, because you ask the right thing, I not only will give you wisdom, but I will give you wealth as never before a man had the opportunity to manage or to handle it. God can do the, the impossible. He's the Almighty. He's supernatural. He heals. He saves. He transforms a shattered life into a life of victory. Many of the great pastors that we have in the world today were our former alcoholic and drug addicts. People that were at the bottom, at the peak of society. And God raised those people because they decided to trust Him from, with all their heart. And when you decide to trust the Lord, He will give you a new life. He will create a new life for you. Amen. And we need to accept it. And not only He creates a new life when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but every day with God. Every day with the Lord is a day of victory. Amen? Amen? Why? Because God is the Creator. He's not in a museum. He doesn't belong in the past. He's never surprised with what we do. Do you think that God is surprised? Oh, look at that. Now they have these phones and they read the Bible on the phone. What a surprise. They're so smart. Do you think that's what God thinks? God looks at us and He smiles. Because these are our toys that He will allow us to have. And we may use those toys and that knowledge and that technology for the glory of God. And that's what we need to do, church. We're not a museum. We are the church of the 21st century. And listen carefully. The world is about to know a revival like we've never seen before. All things were created, made by Him, through Him, and without Him, nothing could exist. And notice that in Genesis 1, as we've read also, the first thing He created, He created light. And the Bible says He separated, He actually separated light uh, out of darkness. In the Genesis 1, 3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. What happened? God said... He's the Word. The Word of God. The Word of God came over a place of chaos, an abyss. And God said, let there be light. Guess what? There was light. In verse 4, God saw that the light was good. So not only God created, but God has a, a quality control department. God created and God verified and He said, this is good. This is good light. And He said that He separated light from darkness. He created a separation. And God called the light day and the darkness He called night. Not only He created, He separated, He controlled the quality, He made it, and light was created. This was the first thing that happened in the creative process. And uh, man still struggle to understand light. I, I was uh, reading on the, on the news this week. I was quite surprised that now uh, 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 American scientists found a way to hide events. Hide events. And you know how, how they're doing it? Because they're studying light. And they found that there's a way to go even beyond the speed of light and they can actually erase an event. That's mind-boggling, eh? Yes. How can you do that? How can you erase an event? Something, it's like something never happened. And you might say, that is impossible. It's impossible for people that live in the past, and it's impossible for people that don't believe in God, because for God, nothing is impossible. And He gave us the same way of thinking as He has. He created us in His image. That's why man, mankind, is so creative. That's why people are thinking, what about if we can bend time? What about if we could travel in time? What about if we could do these things? And we have all these movies and these imaginations and these books written about mysterious things 
and things that at the present time we think this is impossible to happen. But you know why they're in the realm of fantasy? Because they're inside of mankind. And people write about these things. Because eventually, you know what? Guess what? They will happen. And they will not surprise God. Because God, the everlasting God, He has no beginning, He has no end. To Him, it's not different, 1945, from the, the year 1000. God moves through time and through space. And God separates things, God creates things, and the first thing that He wants to create in our lives, He wants to create light and separate light out of darkness. Now, there's a spiritual meaning here. Let me go to my third point. Light shines in the darkness. And let's go to the book of John, the Gospel of John. And again, John 1.1. 1, 1. John 1.1. 1, 1. Now, the book of John, again, wasn't written in English. It was uh, written uh, uh, for, uh, for the Greeks. It was written in Greek, ancient Greek. And again, there was also no punctuation. And, and uh, here's what, uh, what we have in English in the book of John. It says, in the... Beginning. Wow, it starts just like the book of Genesis. There's something here. You know, there's some connection here. In the beginning. Now, John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, this is quite mysterious, but if you know the book of Genesis, if you've never read Genesis, this doesn't make sense. But you see, in order to understand the Bible, we should read it. And I would like to encourage Christians from our church, people that are listening on the internet, read the Bible. Determine this year that you're going to start in Genesis and finish in Revelation. Establish a plan. Read the Bible so you can understand what's happening in your life. So you don't get to a point in which you say, Pastor, I don't know what's happening to me. Well, read the Bible. Read the Bible. Get an understanding of who God is, what He's doing. And here's this amazing statement. In the beginning was the Word. What happened in the book of Genesis? God spoke. God spoke and God said, let there be light. So what was there in the beginning? Light. What happened before light? You're getting close. Sound. Sound. Before light, there was sound. I don't know in what tone of voice God spoke, in what language, but God said something. And when God spoke, sound created light. Does that make sense? Not much. But in the beginning, that sound, and the sound that happened wasn't music. The sound that happened was words. The word. And the word was with God. And in fact, John says the word was God. This is one of the names of God. The Word. With capital D and capital W. The Word. And uh, through Scripture we recognize Jesus Christ as the Word. Now, the Word was God. Verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the light was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has long overcome. Let's compare Genesis 1 with John 1. We have some certain things in common. First thing that we have. In the beginning, God. What comes first? God. Certain other things in common. It talks about light. However, the book of Genesis talks about the creative process in the natural. And the book of John is talking about the creative per, uh, uh, process of God in the spiritual. So in the natural, we have light. Now in the spiritual, John says, Jesus Christ created all things. Without Him, nothing could exist. Everything was created in Him and through Him. And then he says, and in Him was the light of man. So, on the inside of each one of us, we have the possibility of having enlightenment, of having light, or darkness, or darkness. 
And the question is, are you a son of the light or a child of darkness? So these, the differences, and we know it, you know, through history, we know that when we talk about the dark ages, dark things, dark nights, it's not referring to the color of their skin. It's a good thing, eh, Marlon? <laughs> when, when he talks about these things, about the dark nights and all these things, it's not talking about the exterior, but he's talking about darkness on the inside. Are you following me? So, when the darkness installs on the inside, but then Jesus Christ enters into our life, something happens. God says inside of you, let there be light. Amen. And guess what? Now you receive the light of God and you start reading the Bible, you start reading scripture and it makes sense. Now it's not complicated anymore. You know, when you used to go to the Roman Catholic Church and the priest said, Oh, don't read the Bible, it's too complicated for you, you're too dumb to understand it. I don't know if you remember about this, some of you that came from the church, same church where I came. I, I was told, don't read the Bible, that's a very complicated book, you're not smart enough by other words. I felt kind of offended, and I decided to read it. And I read it without Jesus Christ in my life. And it did, didn't make sense, I read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And I read the Maccabees and Tobias, all the Apocrypha, everything in it. And I got to the end and I put it on the shelf. Didn't mean a thing. One day, when I was struggling in my life to understand the meaning of my life, struggling with God, struggling with the world, I invited Jesus Christ to come into my life. And I did a simple prayer and I said, Jesus, give me new life. I repent. I receive you in my heart. Suddenly, something changed. Not in the outside, I was the same person. But inside of me, something started to shine. And I decided to read the Bible. And when I started to read the Bible again, now there was enlightenment. Now it makes sense. You know why the world looks at the church and they say that we're crazy, we're lunatics, we live in the past? It's because we're trying to convince the world about the existence of God by a scientific method. And that cannot happen. The only way you can know God is through revelation. Amen. And revelation comes when you invite Jesus Christ to be your Savior. And then you have light in your heart. And suddenly things make sense. And suddenly God starts a creative process. You're not the same person anymore. You used to be sad. Now you're glad. You used to be sick. Now you're healed. You used to be possessed. Now you're possessed with the Spirit of God. Something Amen. changes in your life. You invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. And that's the beginning. Receiving Jesus Christ is just the beginning. It doesn't end there. It's not that you join the South Shore Club. You're not here in this church and you say, Oh, I'm a member because I pay my tithes. Big thing, try to say that to the Lord. The Lord will say, you're a member of my body when you open up your heart to me and when you allow the light of my Son, Jesus Christ, to shine in you and not in you, but through you. And through that light, people will know who I am because you are the light of the world. So if I give that light to the Lord. Now, verse 9, the same chapter, it says, the true light which enlightens everyone was coming to, into the world. Verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But I love verse 12. But to all, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Amen. Praise God. So enlightenment, spiritual enlightenment, came to who? To all, says the Bible. To all. Now, Jesus Christ came first and foremost to the Jews. His people. And what does the Bible say? His people did not recognize, recognize Him. They denied Him. They didn't believe His message. And then it, it, it says that to all who did receive Him, he gave 
gained the right to become children of God. You know, when I'm a child of a person, I receive some rights, certain responsibilities, and I receive a great blessing, which is belonging to a family. See, when you receive enlightenment, now you become God's family. Like Pastor Bernard was saying, if you feel to come here as your church, you can be part of this family and call some people brother or sister in the Lord. And some people have a problem with this because they say, I don't want religion. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about God's family. You see, we can use all these technologies, TVs, internet, phones, all these things. But without the light of God, without the Spirit of God coming into our heart, separating light from darkness, nothing matters. But when God enters into our life, that separation process begins. And in our heart, now we start feeling, well, I guess this crack cocaine is something of darkness. And I need to separate this thing from my life. Because now I'm a child of God. And then you start saying, well, all this thing, lying and murdering and moaning and criticizing everybody, everyone and everybody, I guess God doesn't like it because it says murderers will not enter heaven. I guess I'm doing something wrong. I need to separate this in my life. And guess what? The Holy Spirit inside of us will help us in this separation process. And as Christians, we need to shine with God's light. When someone looks at you, they shouldn't see a religious person. They should see a child of the living God. Someone that has something to give. Praise God. And it doesn't matter what church you belong to. It doesn't matter what, what is your religion or your background. When you do the work of God, when you manifest the light of God, people will see it. That's what people were seeing in Mother Teresa. A little nun, really short. Not a very beautiful woman in terms of aesthetics. But a beautiful woman on the inside. And that light was shining. And it shone there in India. And it shone throughout the world. Praise God. Why? Because God can pick up anyone He wants. And anyone who says, here am I God. Come, I receive you. The Bible says, He will come. He will make you a child of God. Now, uh, um, let's, let's finish with the last scripture in Matthew chapter 6. You need to make a choice. You see, this doesn't happen, just that doesn't fall from heaven. And now you receive a revelation, now you're a Christian. No, you hear the message. You hear these messages. You hear the word of God being preached. Or you read it, or it doesn't matter how you receive the message. God will use a messenger. And the messenger, uh, God's messengers, it's me, it's you. It's all of those who are God's children. And when you receive the message, you have to make a choice. And here's the choice. In Matthew 6, this is one of the first sermons that Jesus preached. And I really like this, this, uh, this portion of his uh, speech in Matthew 6, 22 to 24. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if, you're, if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. This is really mysterious. How can you have a full body, your body being full of light? I know that people that are into oriental uh, witchcraft and all that, that stuff, Reiki and the, the chakras and the shamans and all these things, they say we all have an aura and, and they even have uh, cameras that can take a picture of a person and you see an aura of light with rainbows and, and all these things. It's not what I'm talking about. It's not what Jesus Christ is talking about. But there's a similarity. Listen to me. There's a similarity in what he's talking about. He's saying, if your eye is good or approved by God, by other words, if you see the world with, through Jesus' eyes, your physical body, your, the container of your soul, becomes enlightened. It's light. In fact, Jesus said, it is full of now then he said, but if your eye is bad, the noise is here, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? 
Well, this can be very mysterious if you never read the, the, the book of Genesis. If you never read John chapter 1, what is he talking about? So if I, it is, does this mean if I have problems in my eyes, I have darkness? No. No, listen to me. If your eye is good, if you see things, if you see the world around you as God's creation, if you see your life as God's gift, if you see your, your brothers and sisters, people that, that are here with you, with an affinity, and if you love them, then, the Bible says, you have life. However, if you decide to see things through a critical eye, judgmental eye, murdering eye, then you have darkness. And Jesus goes to the point to say, it's great darkness. He says, how great is the darkness? Even God is surprised with the darkness that can happen. And he's talking to his disciples. This is not a message to the world. This is a message to the church. And then he finishes on verse 24 by saying, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Or he was uh, he used the word mammon, which which was the divinity, the divinity uh, that included money and wealth and everything that you can acquire with money. You see, certain people they have the opportunity to receive God, to receive Jesus Christ, to receive the light, but they choose the wrong master. They will say, "Oh, life is so short. I'll better be making money." You know, if I become a Christian, I cannot steal from my boss. If I, if I become a Christian, I cannot cheat on my, in my tax returns. And, and all these things. And people get an attraction to the things of the world. We open TV and, and we, 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 I, I cannot watch more video clips of, of songs. Because they cannot sell songs without sex and drugs and money and legs and all these things. So I need to choose what am I going to see. And listen, the things you're attracted to will entrap you. And if you will allow the things of this world to, to, to corner you to a point in which you're even sometimes ashamed of your faith, you're ashamed to even to tell that you're Christian, let me tell you how great is your darkness. And I'm not telling this to condemn you, but to tell you, wake up. Wake up from that state or condition in which you fell asleep. And allow the light of God to shine into your life. My last point before we pray. This year, every, every month, we're going to have a special service where we'll offer a prayer for all of those that are sick, that have a problem, that are under difficult situations. So we're going to open our, our altar to pray for you. We're going to lay hands and to anoint with God. Believe that the light of God is going to enter you. And before we pray, we need to start with an healthy eye. Because if I have darkness in my life, I can pray 24 hours, I can even fast, and nothing will happen. See, what, even people of prayer, they brought a, a young boy to the disciples, and the disciples could not heal this boy. And, and then Jesus rebuked the disciples, prayed for the boy, the boy was instantaneously healed, and then they questioned Jesus. And Jesus said, these cast of demons can only come out with fasting and prayer. And they learned a lesson. So there's a lesson in fasting. But let me finish by telling you about the real fast. And this is in Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 6. And why do I say it's the real fast? Because this is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah and, and telling him, this is the fast that I have chosen. This is what I have chosen. And if you have difficulties of uh, fasting like this, talk to Master Bernard and Talin and come to, to help with share. Because as we read this scripture, you'll understand why you need to do something, take some action with your life. Isaiah 58, 58 6. It is not this the fast that I chose to lose the bonds of wickedness? To undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke, it is not to share. 
You see, share. It's a fun. It is not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. By other words, if you see that person, oh, let me go to the other side of the street. <laughs> oh, thank God for calling this plan. It's her. I'm not asking that one. That's what it's talking about. Verse 8, very, very important. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Amen. I told you we're going to pray for healing. And why do we start talking about light and creation and we finish here? Because many times in life we need miracles. And there are Christians that, that they don't even believe in God for a miracle. They say, oh, my faith is so weak. Do you have light? If you have light, if your eye is good, there's a light, this light will spread through your body. Now, the book of Isaiah gives us the secret, the secret of fasting and praying. Because fasting, it's not the abstinence of food. It's not just when you say, oh, I'm not going to eat for a week or so. No, I used to fast every day. I used to fast 40 days, sometimes just with water. And I always fasted 21 days, just eating a, a, a little soup at the end of the day. And uh, because my body is not as strong as when I was uh, 25, I cannot go those uh, periods of time without God you know, specifically telling me to do this fast. But what is, real, what, what is the real fast? Yes, you abstain from taking certain foods. Daniel will abstain from eating things that were pleasant. And he fasted for 21 days, eating things that he didn't like. Let's say you, you don't like uh, uh, fish. You just eat meat. So you determine, okay, for 21 days, I'm going to eat fish. At the end of the 21 days, you love fish. Okay. But the fast is not about not eating something. Many times I fast, I don't drink coffee. I love coffee. I, I drink about uh, two liters of coffee a day. Because <laughs> I like big cups. <laughs> One to two liters a day. I drink it. If I, if I stop, it's okay, I can stop. So I, that's the way I know I'm not addicted. I can stop two, three days, a week, two weeks. I do a fast of coffee. I say, okay, for 21 days I don't eat, I don't uh, eat bread, I don't drink coffee, I don't uh, eat during the day. I'm just going to eat some vegetables at night. And I determine that, and I say, God, I'm doing this to to seek you, to seek your face. But if I do this and I close myself in my bedroom or somewhere, am I really doing the fast that pleases the Lord? According to Isaiah 58, fasting is about denying yourself to serve others. It's what he talks here. Even those people that you prefer not to talk to, but now you're fasting. And you say, you see on the call display, oh, it's her, not her again. <laughs> but you say, okay. And you decide, I'm going to be a blessing to this person. Amen. And you decide, Oh, I'm going to fast, so while I'm fasting, I'm going to share. To share on Sundays. <laughs> and I'm going to help some people. I'm going to take some people out of misery. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, yes. And it gets to this particular point in verse 8. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn. What happens in the dawn? In the dawn, we have darkness, and suddenly, five minutes later, we have a beautiful day. And 12 hours later, it's right there at the, at, 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 at the top of the bay. Bright shining light. Bright shining light. Sometimes, we need to fast and pray to see the hand of God manifesting the creative power of the Almighty. Fasting is not about the nine food. So, as we finish praying, let me say the last sentence of this verse. Your healing 
shall spring up speedily. Your healing shall spring up speedily. How many of you want to be healed today? You want to be healed today? It just takes faith, determination, knowing who your God is. When you have darkness in your body, you know, even sickness, even sickness manifests many times as dark spots. You know a cancer? A cancer can be white, but most of the times, when, when the doctors cut and they bring it out, most of the times, it's a dark spot. It's not because it has to be, or it has a special meaning, but it has to do with darkness. Sickness is the work of darkness. Healing is the work of God. Amen. 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 I've never seen Jesus going around and spreading sickness around. <laughs> He's saying, here's flu, and here's constipation, and here's this and here's that. <laughs> no. No. Jesus went around, and people came to Him, and they, and, and they would say, let me see. And eyes were opened. People were healed. Lives were transformed. And then after the healing, He would say, now do this, now come and follow me. Now do my work. By other words, do my work. Spread the light. Let the light shine in you first and then through you. Amen. The big mistake of religion, the big mistake of religion is to put a fake mask of holiness. And the spirit of religion leads people to try to look holy by the prayers they do, by the things they do. By the way they speak, by the way they dress, by the things they abstain themselves to do. That's the big mistake of religion. But the reality of a life enlightened by God is very simple. In the beginning, God created. The Word created life. Now, maybe it's the first time that you're listening to this message. This is called the Gospel. This is the real message of the gospel. The gospel is not that you're going on your way to hell and suddenly you find Jesus and you're saved from going to hell. The gospel is not that message. The gospel is very simple. In the beginning there was light. God wants to shine that light inside of you. God wants to do things that will even surprise you. But you need to choose your master. And you need to choose God. And there's no many ways to God. There's one way. Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one can go to God through Muhammad. No one can go to God through Krishna. No one can go to God through Buddha. No one can go to God through reasoning or trying to understand or Bible courses, or whatever. You can only go to God when you accept the life that Jesus brought. He sacrificed, and you say, God, I receive you. And this simple step, this simple prayer, will change your life eternally. Because suddenly, you will feel that joy. And even when people around you are just nagging you, and you really hated that job, now you're right there, and you're singing praises. Now you shine. Now people will say, I'm looking at you, there's something different. What are you taking? <laughs> what are you doing? Is there a natural supplement? Oh, are you taking one of those pyramid things, uh, vitamins that you buy on a, on a multi-level marketing or whatever? <laughs> so, no. Something happened in my life. I gave my life to Jesus. And Jesus gave me His light. And now His light is shining. And tonight, to this morning, let's allow the light of God to shine so that your healing will come out speedily. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us all stand. I'm going to ask the musicians to come. And all of you that went downstairs for prayer, we have prayer here at 9 a.m. And all of you that went for prayer, I'm going to ask you to come forward. Because we need to pray for one another. And it will help if we have people that already pray, pray here for other people. Amen. So we're going to ask you all the, the, the prayer in, uh, intercessors.
or if you just feel you want to pray for someone, come forward, but now our altar is open. Some of you, when I ask, you want to be healed, you lift up your hand. Now it's the time to get out of your seat and to come here forward, because we want to pray for you. So just start coming as we worship the Lord. Amen? Or if there's something dark in your life, you're going through nightmares, or there's something, you know, the doctor, you're afraid of something, come out of your seat, just come forward. All the deacons and leaders of the church, come here, we're going to build an altar, pastors, pastors' wives. We're going to spend these next 10 minutes praying for 